If you enjoy today's content, then please consider supporting Top Hat Gaming Man on Patreon. Yeah! Over the course of the last year on this channel, we have looked at a number of Sega consoles and peripherals, many of which are extremely obscure and never even went on to see the light of day. So, after focusing in on a number of cancelled consoles, today we are going to look at a fairly obscure Sega console that did, in fact, see a commercial release. The Sega SG-1000 is an often overlooked prequel to the Sega Master System, and the first ever Sega home console. Some would even go as far to say that this system was the genesis of all Sega games consoles. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of the SG-1000. Yeah. The SG-1000, which is the short version of the formal name Sega Computer Video Game SG-1000, is the first home console which was released by Sega. It was the brainchild of Sega president Heio Nakayama and was developed in response to a downturn of arcade cabinet sales. The SG-1000 was released on the 15th of July 1983, on the very same day that Nintendo released the Famicom. However, it would never sell on the same level after managing to only shift approximately 2 million units worldwide. Despite its lack of success, Sega did gain some experience from it. A terrible trend was commenced that would remain with Sega until their console days would die, whereby they would release various different versions and peripherals before shelving these machines. Examples include the SC3000 computer and the SG1000 Mark II, which was released shortly after. Finally, some real success would be seen when the Sega Mark III would eventually be released, under the amended name Mast System. Sega would finally gain some much needed credibility in the console market, but this is not the subject of this video. The SG-1000 sported a library of 68 games, which were available on a combination of cartridges and Sega cards. With a couple of hardware additions, it could also be used as a personal computer, much like its SC-3000 variation. Additionally, the technology, though designed for the home, was also used within arcade hardware and would continue to be improved upon until the Sega Mark III aka the Master System was released. The same year the SG-1000 and the Famicom were released, elsewhere in the gaming world we would also see the release of the Casio PV-1000 and the announcement of GameLine, which was a dial-up game distribution service for the Atari 2600, but would never actually see anything on it. In the world of personal computers, Apple would release the Apple IIe, Microsoft of Japan would release the MSX, and Acorn would release the Acorn Electron, which was a cut-down version of the BBC Micro. During the early 1980s, Sega were in the top five arcade manufacturers in America. However, in 1982, things started to slip. This caused Sega's umbrella company, Gulf and Western, to sell its American arcade manufacturing companies and licensing rights to their rival, Bally Manufacturing. Now the arcade business was waning for them, Gulf and Western turned to Heio Nakayama to give them a solution and a new direction. Nakayama took this as an opportunity to use their knowledge and expertise on arcade hardware to make their own move on the home console market in Japan, which at the time was still considered new territory. Nakayama was given the green light and went on to release for SG-1000. Well, actually, it's not quite as cut and dry as that. Sega were initially focusing on the personal computer, the SC-3000, and the imminent release of that before learning that Nintendo were on the verge of releasing a gaming-only console, being the Famicom. This was when they jumped ship and created the SG-1000, which would be marketed as a separate machine from the SC-3000 microcomputer, because Sega does what Nintendo don't, apparently. Both the SG-1000 and the SC-3000 would be released on the 15th of July 1983 in Japan, which as mentioned earlier, was on the same day as the Famicom. 
it would also see a limited release in Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan and even more bizarrely, Italy and Spain. But internationally, Sega wouldn't actually release it into the larger markets such as any of North America, Britain or Germany. This would actually lead to clone consoles being created, which would play the carts, Sega cards and also, weirdly enough, ColecoVision games, though that in itself is a subject for another time. It did alright in Taiwan, however that's because the Famicom never officially made it there. Though, as soon as the Famicom clones were released, the SG-1000 fell into obscurity there too. Weird fact, for whatever reason, the SG-1000 was called the Sega 1000 in New Zealand, but no one really knows why. The launch wasn't great and couldn't compete with the Famicom really. The Famicom was released with three launch titles, very popular arcade ports, including Popeye, Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. The SG-1000 also had three titles for launch, but these were not recognisable, nor had the following Nintendo games already did. However, by the end of 1983, Sega had released 21 games, whereas Nintendo had only released 9, and ended up doing a product recall due to faulty circuitry in the Famicoms. By that point, they managed to shift 160,000 units, which was better than the estimated 50,000 units by Sega originally. Another prominent thing which happened in 1983 was that Gulf and Western decided they were going to get rid of all their apparently non-core businesses. Sega was seen as expendable, however Nakayama managed to set up a partnership with a software company based in Japan called CSK Corporation and managed to buy the Sega brand from Gulf and Western. In doing this, Nakayama managed to secure his position as the CEO of Sega. One of his first acts as CEO, released an updated version of the SG-1000 known as the Mark II on the 31st of July 1984, one year and two weeks after the release of the original. This updated version would include hardware improvements and attachable controllers. The console was released for 15,000 yen, which was the exact same price as its predecessor. It also featured the Sega cards which I mentioned earlier, which were the creation of the lead designer and hardware developer Hideki Sato. He himself vehemently disliked the cartridges which were being used in the SG-1000 because he felt they looked like tombstones apparently, whereas the Sega cards were much more cheerful apparently. Despite the release of the Mark II, Sega simply could not keep up with the Famicom. It was much more advanced, performed better and had a better selection of games. The reason for this is that Nintendo were not afraid to approach third party developers to create games for them, whereas Sega were not prepared to do this. The vast majority of the games they released for the system were homegrown, and this would allow them to have a better longevity than some of the other competition, such as Epoch, Tomy and Casio, all of which were utterly obliterated by the Famicom. The lack of third party games on the SG-1000 came down to Sega's conservatism. As far as Sega were concerned, if a company were competing against them in the arcade market, then they were not prepared to work alongside them in the home console department. This is typical of Sega of Japan, and just proves they were apt at making poor decisions, even in their infancy as a company, thus resulting in the abandonment of the Mark II by 1985. They wouldn't see any true success until they released the Mark III, which we all know saw worldwide success as the master system. Aesthetically, the games on the platform graphically look more in line on what we would see on the likes of the ColecoVision, rather than what we would see on the competing Famicom. In terms of spec, the CPU was an NEC 780C, which was based on the Zlog Z80A. It contained a Texas Instruments TMS9918A graphics chip. The screen resolution was 250 by 192 pixels and it had a colour palette containing 16 different colours. The sound chip was also from Texas Instruments. The system RAM was 17 kilobytes and the SRAM was 1 kilobyte. It is also of note that the controller on the S3 1000 was hardwired to the device, much like the Famicom itself and many other systems from the time period. 
there were also a few peripherals available for the system, because we all know it would not be a real Sega console if it did not have add-ons. This included the SK1100 keyboard, which was compatible with the SG1000, which was the main part which could make it into a personal computer, although you might as well have just bought an SC3000 to begin with, as this add-on alone was 13,800 yen, nearly as much as the SG1000 itself. You could also purchase a joystick to play with rather than a controller, a racing wheel which was specifically made for the Monaco GP game, a plotter printer and something called an SF7000 which added a floppy disk drive for additional memory. Overall I suppose the main reason we do not hear as much about this system on the internet as we do many other platforms is simply due to the fact that it was not released into any of the larger English speaking markets, therefore the internet echo chamber has never treated this platform with the same level of euphoria in which it has done with many others. As stated earlier, all in all there were 68 available cartridge games and 26 Sega card games, so there is a meaningful size library available for enthusiasts of this console. So let's look at some of the main titles on the system. Before Yuji Naka created Edgy the Hedgy, the first game he designed was one of the more notable titles on the SG-1000, which was known as Girl's Garden. In order to be successful in this game, the flowers must be picked at the right time. If they are too big or too small, they will ruin the bouquet. So the player must pick them before they grow too big. Whilst doing this, you must avoid a plethora of bears and bees, because if you touch them, your character sprite will begin to cry. The game has a cheerful sort of Rainbow Island vibe to it. The game is not an arcade port and can only be found on the SG-1000 platform, a true bloody exclusive. Another game of note for the system is Congo Bongo, a game developed by Sega which was published on a number of different platforms. This game was originally released in the arcade and is often seen as the isometric answer to Donkey Kong. What makes the SG-1000 version of this game special is the fact that it was the only time we saw this Sega game actually released on a Sega console. It is just a pity that the system's limitations caused Sega to essentially release a completely different game, which was non-isometric. This is an interesting part of Sega history nonetheless. In Doki Doki Penguin Land, not to be confused with Doki Doki Panic or Doki Doki Literature Club, you play as a penguin who must destroy the blocks below it in an attempt to escort an egg to the bottom of the screen. Throughout this puzzle platformer, the player must also avoid various enemies including polar bears in this heart throbbing fiasco. Whilst an arcade port of this game does exist, the game was originally released on the SG-1000. One of the very best games on the Atari 2600 is Hero, made by Activision. Hero also saw a release on the SG-1000, and is also one of the best games on that platform as well. There is not many great third-party titles on the system, but Hero is certainly an exception to that rule. This version of the game is graphically superior to what can be found on the older Atari platform. However, the character sprite's helicopter propeller is replaced with a jetpack for some odd reason. In this game, you must ascend through mineshafts while simultaneously rescuing people and killing enemies with your freaking laser beams. This game is an all-time classic no matter which system you choose to play it on. It is impossible to do a video on a Japanese games console without mentioning a space shooter. So, on this occasion, I am going to give the nod to Starjacker. Starjacker is arguably the SG-1000's answer to Xevious and plays in a similar fashion too. The game displays its own level of unique charm and is said to be the best scrolling shooter on the platform. While Starjacker did see an arcade release, the SG-1000 version of the game is the only home port of the game. So ladies and gentlemen, that was the Sega SG-1000, the first platform to go up against the dominance of Nintendo. Most people in the West think the Master System as the platform that tried to go one on one with the Nintendo Entertainment System, but prior to that, the SG-1000 tried taking on the NES in its Famicom incarnation. Is the SG-1000 as good as the Famicom? Obviously the answer is hell no, and it is more on par with the likes of the ColecoVision. Sega would need to go back to the drawing board and create the Master System to make a platform with better specs than the NES. 
Despite persistent limitations though, and poor sales, the SG-1000 still holds an extremely important part in video game history, as the first Sega home games console ever, and apart from that, the platform has a respectable lineup of games to explore too. So, people in the West should try to stop overlooking this little system really, and aim to end the perpetual myth that the first Sega games console was the Master System. Yeah. Thank you for watching today's video, do not forget to like the video and hit the subscribe button for more in-depth content on gaming history every single week. Let me know in the comment section if you have had any experience with the SG-1000 and which games I should put some solid playtime into in the future. Which underrated systems would you like me to cover in detail on this channel in the future? My channel Top Hat Gaming Man is partly funded from the fantastic support and donations I receive from my lovely Patreon benefactors. So shout outs to Carl Johnson, Suzuka Kobayashi, Stuart McDermott, Greg Hooper, Harold Webb, Synth Spaces, Kevin Verhaley, David Mountford, Andrew Bazanski, Edward O'Reilly, Michael Keneally, Tom Elliott, Mark S. Hines, Gary Pinkett, The Gaming Muso, Sponge Matt B, Quang DX and all of my other patrons. You people motivate me to no end when it comes to pumping in hundreds of hours of work every month to bring these videos to life. So as always, from the bottom of my heart, thank you ever so much. Cheerio.